for folks who want to get started out as science communicators, what's like step one? Find something that you're interested in. That's an important step. And it's actually a step that a lot of people, I think, gloss over. Mm. If I say, yeah, I'm going to do a science communication on biology. There, there's so many angles for me to go at that I get overwhelmed so fast. Yeah. So if, I, if I'm starting up on a week and I'm like, I want to educate on this and I'll pick like frog chromosomes, mm-hmm. like, like that is so niche. And, but there's so much content that I can make from that because it's something I'm highly interested in. And, and that's, that's kind of the thing that I've learned is just like get extremely niche. Just, just yeah. find like the, the smallest thing that fascinates you no matter how weird it is and, and just educate on that because people, will, pe- people can tell that that's what you're passionate about. Hey folks, thank you for tuning in to the Grad School Sucks podcast, the show for grad students who want to survive grad school and thrive in their career afterwards. I'm your host, Matt Carlson, and today I'm talking with the one, the only, Dylan, the biologist. Dylan Jones is a biologist and science communicator, as well as the founder of Learn Adventurously, which is an online platform for science enthusiasts. Dylan joins the podcast to talk all about frogs, discuss his experiences in grad school, and describe how budding science communicators can build a following of folks who want to hear about their unique scientific perspective. Be sure to listen to the whole episode to hear Dylan's best frog joke, find out why he slept on a sleeping bag instead of a mattress for a year, and learn about the conservation trips to Belize that Dylan organizes and leads every year. This episode is perfect for folks who have an interest in biology as well as anyone who wants to dive deeper into the art of science communication. Be sure to follow Dylan on Instagram at DylanTheBiologist and check out his website LearnAdventurously.com. Feel free to scroll down into the description of this episode in order to find clickable links to both Dylan's Instagram and website. I'm so excited to be able to share my conversation with Dylan with you today. Be sure to stick around to the very end of the episode to hear Dylan's responses to the bonus questions. I bet you can't guess what Dylan's spirit animal is. And without further ado, let's get to the interview. All right, well, Dylan, Dylan, the biologist. Thank you, sir, for coming on the show. Uh, if you could let everyone know a little bit about who you are and where they can find you. Yeah, so uh, I'm Dylan. I'm a biologist uh, as well as a science communicator, and I have a little uh, a little business called Learn Adventurously. So best place you can find me is on Instagram. To be honest, at just Dylan the biologist. Very cool. Very cool. And you are currently in grad school. Is that correct? Right. Are you nearing the end? Yeah, nearing the end, which, you know, I've okay. been saying that for a few years now. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it seems to stretch out sometimes. Um, very cool. So what what brought you to grad school? Why did you decide to go to grad school? Uh, I mean, it's it's kind of, I guess, that, that standard story of I got into research when I was an undergrad. Um, I had a bunch of people that said, should go to grad school, and, and I agreed. Uh, realistically, I just wanted to improve my skills a lot. I, I didn't know if I wanted to stay in academia yet, so I opted for a master's. And uh, my background was entirely ecology-based, and I wanted to kind of learn more about evolution, learn more about how to code, how to anal- how to analyze things a little bit better. So um, I very much saw grad school as a training thing for me. Very cool. And did you always think that you were going to go into science, generally speaking? Probably since I was about 14 or 15, I, I okay. saw something science, working with animals, biology related. But yeah, it's, I mean, it's changed so many times over the few years. So yeah, for sure. Very cool. What's your experience in grad school been like thus far? Uh, utter shit. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it doesn't help that I'm like, got into the swing of grad school right when the, you know, the pandemic started yeah but um no i just i i I don't know it was just a very different experience than what i imagined uh and yeah not an enjoyable one for the most part yeah what what did you imagine it would be like uh i thought it would just be like really focusing on the research and just collaborating with a bunch of people and having this like really really great experience with like-minded individuals that are all pushing and and what i what i realistically found is that it's i'm just constantly struggling with money 
constantly overstressed and not actually able to work on my research. I have to do like three other things before I can mm -hmm. even look at my research. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just very different. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, what are your thoughts on, so do you have like a, I know this is a terrible question for many grad students. Do you have a date when you think you'll be out the door, dissertation done, moving on? Yeah, we're looking at spring. Uh, we're just deciding like what time is best because I have mm -hmm. like three other things going on. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're trying to see if we can get myself an extra month by technically graduating over the summer, but just probably April, May-ish, sometime around there. Of this year? Or of, of, 20, uh, of 2023? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's that's coming around the door. Yeah. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're dissertating already. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just trying to finish it up right now. It's like, I'm basically just in the writing stage. So yeah. Yeah. So your analyses are complete. Yeah. Mostly complete. I think it's like one or two models I have to run, something like that. So yeah. Do you mind sharing what your dissertation's about? Yeah. So it has uh, morphed into like an unwieldy monster. Basically, I got really into this idea. Uh, there's this method called phylo regionalization, uh, phylogenetic biogeographical regionalization, if we expand all the words out. And really what it is, is it's trying to infer regions of shared evolutionary history. So you just like take all the species in an area, take their evolutionary history, and then find little pockets of, oh, there's a lot of endemic species that are only found here, and it's kind of a unique region. So I'm doing that for uh, I have, I have two parts. One of them is for the world's turtles, uh, which was mm -hmm. actually the easier one to do because there's like three, I think it's 356 species of turtle around the world. Uh, so it's a relatively small data set compared to the one I'm doing with Middle America, which uh, Middle America in, in this definition is like Mexico and Central America. Mm -hmm. And so that one's all of the reptiles and amphibians of Middle America. Uh, I think the data set, it, it hovers, but I think right now it's around 1,600 species. So uh, just trying to find those little hot spots of evolutionary history and then run some post hoc analyses to just answer some cool questions with them. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. A lot of things I don't know about because I'm study humans, but um, what are you thinking about for after grad school? Yeah, I've been trying to figure that out a little bit. Um, so I have some job applications out there. I'm, I, I used to work in a natural history museum, and that's stuff that I've been looking at a lot because I just absolutely love the environment. I, I love the work. It fits me mm -hmm. really well. Um, but I also have a very solid basis to kind of do my own stuff, do entrepreneurial stuff. Um, I lead uh, trips to like eco trips out to conservation areas to raise money for conservation. And I also have a business where I sell like online courses, mm -hmm. which um, both of those are actually doing a little bit better than I anticipated. So it's, yeah. it's seeming as a viable option, but I'm just uh, kind of in this, I'll apply to things, I'll work on things after grad school when I'm, I'm already going to be uh, abroad for like two months on a contract. So that's what the time I can really just say, what am I going to do? Yeah. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, um, yeah, whenever you said the you worked at a museum already, did you say that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That feels so, like, such a, I mean, all of those things feel like a natural fit. But when you said that first, I was like, oh, that feels like Dylan. Like, obviously, this is the first time we've met, e-met or whatever. Yeah. But um, with your content, it's so, like, funny and engaging. And it's it's, you don't come across as... I feel like what would be called the classic scientist who's a little bit maybe aloof or like difficult to understand. Um, I feel like you break down things in I, as a science communicator, I guess, which is a term I only learned in the past year or two. Um, so let's go back for a little bit. So okay, your yeah. trips, uh, uh -huh. where do those, so I, I remember seeing you had a trip that went somewhere in South America. And I think this was like a year ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, so, yeah. Could yeah, you speak a little bit more? Yeah, about it was, it was a Belize, a Central America, okay. um, but still tropical. Basically, uh, I was down there on a research gig. Uh, I, I keep going back to the same research station down there, the tropical research and, oh gosh, I'm forgetting words. Tropical research education. And there's a second E and I don't know why I'm forgetting. 
trees. They're great. Um, <laughs> talk to Vanessa. She's cool as hell. Um, but yeah, I, I, I went down there for a few years and I made a really good friends with the tour guide, uh, mm. local Legion tour guide. And he just said, hey, do you want to run some trips, dude? Like he'll handle yeah. logistics. I'll handle marketing. And uh, we just started doing it, and they're, they've been really fun. We just do a, basically a conservation tour through the whole country uh, with a really large focus on, like, women in conservation down there because there's some just really badass women. That's awesome. Could you explain, like, what is a conservation tour? Yeah, so a conservation tour, I mean, there's so many different definitions, and a lot of places have a lot of, like, greenwashing that goes into their marketing. Uh, realistically, the way we're doing it is you're staying at research stations or you are actively staying in areas uh, that have access to research stations. Uh, and we are touring different aspects of conservation. So we try to do we try to do the beaches, of course, because a lot of people go to Belize for the beaches. They just want to go to like Key Cocker and, and hang out in the sun. But we also spend a lot of time in the jungle. So we actively stay at a research station, see uh, like that mist netting. I lead a herp walk while we're down there. We do a lot of bird watching and we just see how the research is being done. And then we go to like a, a coral restoration site or the Jaguar Reserve or get like a behind the scenes look at the Belize Zoo, which does a ton of conservation in the country. Uh, so really, it's just a, it's a trip that is focused on conservation, research, wildlife, that type of stuff. Yeah, very cool. Who would you say are is like the average uh, attendee on these trips? Yeah, it is. Uh, so far, I, I can't say we have an average. It's it's usually people who, you know, if, if we go in like demographics, they skew more young, uh, they skew uh, female. Uh, that seems to be mm -hmm. the general trend with uh, nature stuff. Uh, but a lot of the times it's it's people who are uh, who maybe had a biology degree, but aren't working in biology for whatever reason, just, you know, whatever life chucks your way. Uh, but they're always interested in nature, but they just want to get their nature fixed, not as a job, but as a, on the side. So, yeah, uh, yeah, that, that's kind of also who I market to now, because that seems to work better. You know, I can't really market to grad students because they don't have money. So, yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What uh, what's your favorite part of doing those trips? Oh, gosh. It's honestly just like the connections you make with people. Um, because I like I'm, I'm an introvert at heart, like I usually recharge alone. I'm not really a, like want to hang out with a bunch of people at all times. Hmm. But whenever we have this group, we all just become extremely close over the span of, you know, seven days. Uh, and it's, it's over like silly stuff most of the time. Like with this last one, we had a uh, uh, a few of us got like some uh, cassava poisoning, you know, just like food poisoning. Uh, mm. And it, it's it's similar to cyanide poisoning because well, it, it is cyanide poisoning. You get the cyanide or whatever. Um, it's kind of common. It's low dose. You really just, you know, have intestinal problems, have to run to the bathroom a lot. But the group just kind of made it into such a fun thing. We all said that we were part of the cassava cult. And every time we were running to the bathroom, we were making an offering. And it was just... I don't know. It was just a lot of fun. Uh, so it's like yeah. even the, the, the kind of things that I associate as like the, the crappy sides of field work or uh, like just going out. It's the, the people that are on there, they're on vacation and they think it's super cool. Where I'm like, normally, whenever I get food poisoning in the field, I'm like, this sucks. I have to yeah. go survey. <laughs> yeah. 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 And just for all the, the folks, like let's say U.S. folks who've never tra traveled out of the country, getting food poisoning is so common. Yeah. And and honestly, pretty hard to prevent and um, fairly easy to treat. You know, yeah. I got food poisoning in Nicaragua because I had some probably some unwashed lettuce on like a mm -hmm. taco or something. And it just happens. But yeah, yeah, that is a fun story. Uh, do you have any trips planned coming up? Yeah, so we're about to do another round of Belize trips again. Uh, we've updated the schedule a little bit to include more stuff and make it a little more varied. But yeah, they're they're coming up this, uh, well, summer of 2023. Summer of 2023. Very cool. Where, If folks wanted to learn more about what's coming up, where would they go to for that? Uh, your best bet is you can either go to the, my website, which is just learnadventurously.com. I'll have a, whenever we're advertising it actively, there'll be a big banner up that says mm -hmm. hey there's trips going on uh but also just on instagram that's usually where i do most of the marketing so you'll definitely see it if you're following me yeah for sure live adventurously.com you learn. got that learn, learn adventurously. yeah yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a great domain yeah yeah that's a, that's an awesome one um so i was wondering if we could talk a little bit about your your work as a science communicator um 
And maybe you could, if folks don't know the term or don't know generally what a science communicator does, could you just give us like a little intro into what that world's about? Yeah, a science communicator, I mean, it's yeah, someone who communicates science. Uh, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. Some people just like to share news, uh, like this publication just came out, here's what it means, while others fall into more of a science educator, which is kind of where I think I lie a little bit more, yeah. where we, we take down topics uh, we, and we break them down and make them easier to understand. Uh, usually for the general public, but uh, I kind of skew my audience to a little bit, you know, like they've maybe had a intro level biology course at like a community college or something. Mm -hmm. um, so because I don't like the the very, I, I like to go a little bit more in depth. That's just what I like to do. So yeah, yeah, for sure. And I must say, I've definitely learned more about frogs since following your account than I think I ever have in my entire life. <laughs> um, we talked a little bit before about how I used to be into frogs when I was a kid, but I never, you know, I might have had a book or something on them. But yeah, you, you really dig deep. Um, and that was one of the things that attracted me to your account first were uh, the posts that had the, you know, you'd swipe through and you'd learn things, the static posts, but also like the reels. Um, it's very like infotainment, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Both, like, yeah. Yeah. You know, entertaining and uh, informative. Um, what, what do you want to do with science communication? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've definitely debated that a lot. Uh, if, if, if I go this more like entrepreneurial route, that's definitely gonna be more of my career. Uh, mm -hmm. it's just science communication, uh, where basically, I mean, you, you make 90% free content and then you have 10% sure. extra that is paid and that's how you make your money. Um, but e even if I don't, I, I've always just enjoyed the creative process. I, I've always just enjoyed communicating and enjoyed educating. And I think no matter what job or career or whatever I do in the future, uh, I'm always going to be communicating science or educating in some capacity. Yeah, very cool. When did you first get started doing science communication work? Oh, gosh. Um, maybe I think it was... Ooh. That's a good question. So I started this Instagram account, I think, six years ago. Um, wow. But yeah, it, it's gone through in various capacities. So I've also done some like in-person stuff uh, for, I, I used to work with this organization called, uh, they're no longer around, but the, the Urban Interface. And they just did uh, work with birds of prey and raptors. So uh, just teaching the public about like, hey, this is a cool bird of prey. Like, here's, here's what a reptile hawk does or whatever. Um, so I think I've been doing this, I think it's pretty fair to say maybe, yeah, six, seven years at this point. Yeah. Do you have any, uh, have there ever been any, I don't know, like standout moments or stories in science communication that made you feel like, oh, this is why I do science communication or maybe the opposite, maybe like weird stories of people disagreeing with you or something. Yeah, uh, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag at times. Um, you, you learn pretty quickly that there's just like certain topics that are really hard to bring up. Mm. Uh, and and I, I, there's often moments where I'll say something and people will get mad at me, but they're agreeing with me. And it's like, what, like, you're not reading, you're not looking through it. Um, but yeah, if I, if I think about like standout moments, there was, uh, I went to this science communication conference over the summer, which was just really, really cool. Uh, I got to meet up with a whole bunch of them, learn some really good tips and tricks. And I think the biggest thing was there was this uh, combating misinformation workshop and it was really informative. And I think it really made me kind of go back to the drawing board on how I'm addressing some science communication thing or science uh, misinformation things. Mm. Uh, because there's just like weird strategies that I, I don't think I realized I was doing that was actually like hurting my intended goal. Oh, really? Yeah, it was it was like this really weird thing. And it was comforting knowing that like everyone in that room had been doing the same thing. So it was like really good. Um, it was things like specifically addressing uh, people who are throwing out misinformation, like saying X, Y, Z said this. It's very rarely you actually need to say that. Mm. Um, it's you're just giving them free publicity. And also people tend to, you know, you can you can explain a topic to someone and they'll completely agree with you. But then when you say the name of the person who gave the bad information, then they completely change their tune. They're like, well, no, no, he's right. He's right. It's like, OK, well, so now it's just keep it very general. Um, it's also like not responding to people who uh like 
country, who try to say you're wrong in your mm. comment section, I, I've always responded. That's just what I've always yeah. done. And what it what it showed was that it's kind of both sizing the argument, even if it's like just ridiculously, you know, anyone with like yeah, any little bit of critical thinking can kind of see this isn't the same, but um, it both sides the argument. It kind of elevates it as well. Um, mm -hmm. So by just ignoring it or being just a little sarcastic back, uh, it's it's tends to be better. And also I found that's a lot better for my mental health too. I'm just like, I don't care anymore. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's funny. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't put out a whole lot of like super in deep, in depth information. Obviously, mostly I've just done memes. Um, but every once in a while, you do get someone who just like had a bad day or, yeah, you know, life just didn't work out for them. And you happen to like riff on a topic that was associated with that. And the therapist in me, well, I wouldn't say the therapist, the person in me who wants to help everyone, um, always wants to like, find some middle ground or something. Mm -hmm. But nine times out of 10, it does seem to devolve into just like senselessness where the person just wants to lash out and yeah. that, that's all they want to do. And um, yeah, the internet is a very interesting breeding ground for uh, some, some great communication and some just like kind of garbage communication. Yeah, exactly. But especially in comment sections. I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, like I put in hours of effort into a post and then you put in five seconds of effort to write a comment. Like we're not, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not equivalent. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah. I'd love to talk more about science communication. So this is something that I, I've never done. I know, I know a couple of people doing it, um, in the like social science space and then I know about you and your account and probably a couple others, but that's about it. But I know a lot of people are really interested in, <clears throat> in doing science communication work as a grad student, building a brand, and then either leveraging that into like something entrepreneurial, kind of like what you're talking about, like maybe these kinds of trips, or having it as almost like a um, proof of concept for when they're going for academic jobs as like, Hey, you know, I've also, I've taught these courses, but I've also built an online platform talking about, you know, the same kind of topics. So for folks who want to get started out as science communicators, what's like step one? Find something that you're interested in. Um, I, and I, I think that's like, that's an important step. And it's actually a step that a lot of people, I think, gloss over. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. And when, when I say something you're interested in, not the thing you should be interested in and not like a very general topic. Like, yeah, I'm interested in biology, but if I say, yeah, I'm going to do a science communication on biology, there, there's so many angles for me to go at that I get overwhelmed so fast. Yeah. So if, I, if I'm starting up on a week and I'm like, I want to educate on this and I'll pick like frog chromosomes, mm -hmm. like, like that is so niche. And, but there's so much content that I can make from that because it's something I'm highly interested in. Right. Um, I, I know a lot about it, so it, it pushes me to really make stuff. Um, and, and that's that's kind of the thing that I've learned is just like get extremely niche. Just just yeah. find like the, the smallest thing that fascinates you, no matter how weird it is, and, and just educate on that because people will pe people can tell that that's what you're passionate about. And a lot of the times the passion will come through more than the actual content, the wording or anything else. Yeah. The riches are in the niches for sure. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in terms of like the, the method of being a science communicator, um, you know, there's blogs, there's YouTube channels, there's Instagram. And even in Instagram, there's static posts and there's real or like short form video content. Uh, what do you think? What do you think people should when they have all these options of like different tools to use? What should they pick up? What should they try? What should they focus on? Yeah, it's it's a tough one to really say because I I would say in today's social media presence of yeah, Instagram Reels, YouTube Shorts, uh TikTok, stuff like that, I would say video. Like that's the most bang for your buck right now, but I also understand a lot of people are very very nervous about being on camera or being yeah. on a video. Um so I I say find something that is super super simple. 
just just mm-hmm. start with a picture and a caption. I mean, that's that's how I started out. That's how almost every science communicator I know started out, uh, especially in like the wildlife spaces. They took a picture of something and they wrote a caption about it. Mm, um, yeah. It's it's not super engaging. Uh, not you know you you learn over time that captions people don't really read them. Blah blah blah. But it, it gets you in the process of actually doing it. If you are a fantastic writer and you you don't like doing you know caption or taking pictures. You can absolutely do a blog. Um, and the cool thing is now with, with like Instagram specifically, uh, you can do just carousel posts. And mm-hmm. I see so many carousel posts that are just nothing but text. And they just literally have a, you know, a nice pastel background and they copy and paste text over the course of like 10 pictures that people swipe through. Um, so it, it's, you know, if you, if you want to figure out what you're really good at, if you're good at graphic design, just start making little basic graphic design things. But again, it's something that you need to be comfortable with, but that also has a very, very, very low barrier to entry. Mm. Um, if, if you're wanting to produce videos, and that's awesome, but if you're going to have to take 20 to 30 hours per post to make a great video, you're going to get burnt out and you're maybe going to make two or three. Like I yeah. just speaking from experience that that's what's going to happen. But if instead you're like, I'm going to make a 30 second video. Uh, it, most people can make a 30 second video in a day, even if they don't have a whole lot of skills with it, they can just pick up a, their phone and record themselves. So yeah, it's that old, like, keep it simple, stupid, like mm-hmm. <laughs> advice. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, writing is always good. Writing is always good. You're always going to have to write no matter what. Um, and this is also assuming that you want to be like a, a public facing science communication person, not someone working in the back end for like a YouTuber or, mm. uh, for like a, a museum or anything like that. Are there a lot of those jobs? I never even considered that. Yeah, there's a lot more coming out nowadays. Um, it's huh. many organizations are realizing how useful of a skill it is to have a script writer or a um, or a uh, yeah, like a like I know a buddy who uh, he designs the exhibits for like nature centers and stuff like that. So the pe- the person who like writes all that information yeah. for you know like this is a I don't know like a leopard frog and here's how big they get and all that stuff like. It's a, it's a job and people need to do it. If, you know, if you're good at that, if you're good at copywriting, uh, you know, make a little Fiverr account and just say you're good at scientific copywriting or scientific illustration. And yeah, I mean, that's, if you want to do it more as a career instead of a hobby, instead of resume building, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's, it's becoming more and more of a thing. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, I know, you know, many people start in science communication, not to make money. They're doing it as a hobby. They're doing it because it's something they like. But then ultimately, you're putting so much time and effort into it that um, it just it it begs that if you're gonna continue to put time and energy into it, that you get something out of it. Mm-hmm. And when that and that's like a careful conversation about like how you do it and when you do it. And um, but for you, when did you decide it was time to, I guess, like monetize is like the you know inside baseball term but when was the when was the time that you were thinking about okay maybe i should turn this into something that can actually make money it was uh almost two years ago today yeah really um okay. basically it was well it was it was new years of 2020 i guess um i i did a full like rebranding uh everything and it basically what happened was it was like uh Went through a breakup. I was at the end of a pandemic. Uh, I was like massively depressed and I realized that I was spending all my time on content creation because that's what I really, really like doing. Mm -hmm. Um, It it brought me a lot of joy in my life and it was something that I was good at. I mean, and I'd been doing it for years already. Um, I was kind of already at that point mostly disillusioned with academia and Mm -hmm. just not really seeing a path forward. So I, uh, yeah, I was like, let me, let me, let me just focus on this, see what I can do. And, uh, yeah, it's been uh, a lot more enjoyable and I've had a lot more fun after like really hyper focusing on it. Yeah, no, that makes total sense, dude. Um, and, and just to highlight uh, maybe the unsung hero part of this story, that was two years ago and you started this account six years ago, right? Right, yeah. So for all the you know newbie science communicators out there, you don't necessarily have to wait four years, but you do have to, you know, yeah, you got to build up some inertia over time. Yeah, um, and you got to develop your skills and everything. Mm-hmm. And, and I always say, like, it, it took me, yeah, it took me, like, four or five years to get to, like, 15K followers or something like that. And then it took six months to get to 25K. Like, it's yeah. just, like, it's in leaps about. And then, like, I've been stuck here for, at 25K for, like, a year. So, whatever. Yeah, we've you all know? been stuck here. <laughs> yeah. So, it's just, like, yeah. it is what it is, you know? Yeah. During the pandemic, I was getting, like, 500 
follows maybe more a month mm-hmm. and now i've i've grinded for several months to get 500 mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> 500 yep. more but yeah that's just how the game goes um oh shit what was i gonna ask tell me about frogs what do you Where like do about frogs oh, man. <laughs> so I, I i kind of mentioned like a frog chromosomes and it's funny because I've, I've never studied chromosomes in a professional sense at all but um, recently I've just been extremely fascinated with sex chromosomes in frogs because they're just absolutely insane. Um, so, you know, like a sex chromosome is just a chromosome that has a, the, the gene that encodes for, you know, the, uh, development of a particular biological sex or whatever. Uh, in humans, we have this X, Y system, you know, like, uh, the, if you have the Y chromosome, you have this gene that develops like typically into male um other organisms like birds for example famously have a zw system where it's sort of the opposite if they have a chromosome they develop into into a biological female type of stuff Hmm. um but then in frogs it's like it's it's species dependent so some species are xy some species are zw uh but then there's even one species uh oh god it's it's a japanese wrinkled frog it's like a glandarana rugosa i think they have it where different populations, some of them have XY, some of them have ZW, and there's these hybrids that have like both kind of going on, and it's just a messy system. Uh, on top of the fact that like the sex chromosome is a different chromosome in like many different species, it just keeps changing. So it's it's just kind of a really messy system, but mm-hmm. because of that, it forms these really cool stories, really cool like evolutionary histories that are just like super fun to get into and disentangle and try to figure out what the hell is going on. So, but it would, you know, if we zoom out with frogs, that kind of seems to be with everything, like any system that goes on with frogs, the more you look into it, the more crazy it gets. Yeah. What is frogs evolutionary history? Oh gosh. Uh, let me think. I believe frogs or amphibians at large, uh, diverged from, your reptiles around 330 million years ago Mm. um so they used to just have like this like proto one that kind of looked a little bit like both somewhat amphibious uh proto ancestor Uh, and then since then they've just evolved outwards um part of part of my my current master's research is looking at that of like in central america what was their evolutionary history and you see this like really really fascinating patterns of uh, times where they have dispersed into new areas. They've just, uh, you know, usually with uh, glaciation, so, you know, glaciers mm. making the earth colder. Uh, and then as they recede, there's now more habitat, more areas the frogs can be in. And they'll, come, I mean, all organisms to a degree kind of follow those trends, but you'll see that. And then the frogs will just sit in an area for a while and then it'll start speciating into many different forms. When they hit uh, the Central Americas and uh, other more tropical regions, they started to diverge instead of, uh, if we think about it, like horizontally across a landscape, like they went into the grasslands, they went into the swamps, they went into this and that. Uh, Then they started to diverge vertically. So kind of at different levels of the tree. I mean, there's there's like glass frogs that are only found at the the top of the highest trees that are almost impossible to survey for because they're just so hard to find. Um, And then you have some that burrow into the ground and some that just stay in the water. So there's just this incredible diverse array of evolutionary history that i'm just fascinated with yeah that's awesome so we talked about this a little bit before when i asked you the three i call them bonus questions which listeners if you're interested in hearing dylan's answers to the bonus questions you can wait until the very end of the episode after i do the outro to hear what he said um but what frog or frog species multiple species are your favorite and why Ooh, so I have a, I have a particular fondness for the uh, blue spotted tree frogs. Um, I, I did a little research study with them. I, I did a diet study. I raised some of them in a lab from like single celled organism up to like little froglets. And that mm. was just something I enjoyed. Uh, also, they developed from that, like they went through the whole tadpole stage in like two days. It was insane, like crazy fast. Uh, there's other ones in the same property that take about a year. So it's just like, I wasn't expecting them to go that fast. I was like, oh, this yeah. is great because I was staying up all night in the lab and I, I don't think I slept for two days and I was just like jittery on coffee. So I have just like really fond associations with them. Uh, in fact, like, if you, you know, I, we, I often run into them on the trips and I've, 
sort of developed this i just like making frog calls like it's something mm-hmm. that i've been practicing for a long time and it's great because a lot of the times the frogs call back <laughs> so it's it's been really fun like those guys are like <laughs> so it's just like a little bit of a call but it, it works about half the time um so i'm really fond of them uh just just i don't know and they're just pretty they're just super pretty frogs yeah. I, I just really like them so that's i don't know i just have fond memories of those i guess huh. Are there frog call whistles? I don't know if there's whistles. Um, because frog calls are weird. They they yeah. are weirder to make. Um, I, I imagine they're... I don't know. Well, if you figure out how to do it, I would buy yeah, one from right. you. Right? <laughs> I, I, might, I might look into that because that'd just be fun. <laughs> that'd be hilarious. Um, I just randomly thought... I know you're not on TikTok. We talked about that. A uh, little bit before, but although I think you would kill on TikTok, just to be clear, uh, I was on. This was like a month ago. I was just on TikTok, like burning brain cells, and um, I came across this guy who he lived in some like marshy swamp area, and I don't think he was biologically trained um, or formally trained as a biologist. But uh, he had gone around and collected, like, a a ton of frog eggs. Like, it was after it rained or something during the breeding season. I don't know the technicalities. But, and he had a whole, like, like a, like a big, like, almost like a trash can full of them. Mm. It was like a wide one. Maybe like a feeding trough is probably more of what it was. Mm. And he had this whole thing of frog eggs. And he like birthed pretty much all of them and they were all going around as tadpoles and he would like feed them and he was raising them up as frogs. And I was like, wow, that is really bizarre, but I kept on watching. So obviously it was good enough to be content, but I noticed in a lot of the comment sections, people were talking about how him doing that and then releasing this many frogs into the area could like, you know, disturb the like, ecological balance or something like that does that does that make sense to you or or is it not a problem i think it depends it definitely depends a lot on like how they're being released where they're being released blah 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 but i mean it's that that's also kind of my problem with tiktok is there's a lot of people who really think they're experts but don't you know it's like they're they're not uh also in the comments like (laughs) adding to it you know um there's a chance but at the end of the day like if there's still little froglets that are being released not like you know if he's releasing like ten thousand adult frogs that's a very different story um i think it was i think it was like 50 or a hundred thousand and he was gonna do them as adults and he seemed like the kind of person who would just drive over to a pond and just dump the whole he's, thing in. he's not gonna have enough food to feed that many like yeah. they are gonna die <laughs> <That's> <laughs> like, like they eat so much but the thing is the frogs are like usually pretty low on the totem pole of uh yeah. the, the food web like they're 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 prey species for a lot of organisms especially things like birds uh snakes especially to love frogs so i mean assuming they're all pretty small little froglets it's a good chance most of them are just gonna die uh mm-hmm. it, it's 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 almost certain that almost all of them or most of them are going to die. Um, so I don't really know if it's going to cause that big of a disruption, um, but it can like, yeah. yeah, it's, it just all depends on how it's done as the thing. I mean, of course, like, yeah, you, if you want to do like wildlife restoration or anything like that, don't, don't just do it for TikTok and, sure. you know, like, like work through proper agencies, talk to people who know what they're doing, who are actually monitoring this stuff. I bet there's some biologist at that like wondering where the hell did all the frog and eggs go? And he's writing up a publication because he thinks there's something going wrong. And it's just some dude on TikTok yep. putting them in a bucket. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, God, that'd be funny. Uh, so to go, to go, Take frogs back into science communication. You you mentioned um, that you did a rebranding about two years ago. Yep. Um, could you tell us a little bit about why you did that and kind of what that entailed? Yeah, so basically the the order of operations was I, I realized I wanted to do this more full time. I wanted to do mm-hmm. this, uh, wanted to do science communication a little bit more intentionally. I used to just post about three times a week and it was very much so 
picture with a, with a caption talking about something. And um, my, my username also used to be contemporary conservationist. The, the whole idea was like, I want to bring conservation to the 21st century and actually that type of mentality. And I liked alliteration. But uh, I, I, as I was doing the science communication, I realized that one of the biggest problems is that scientists are not humanized in any way. Uh, mm -hmm. We're still kind of locked away and we're just like a amorphous scientist and no one really knows what that is or what we are. And at the end of the day, scientists are people too. Uh, that's just the, the, the nature of it is we are yeah. people who are scientists. So I changed it to be Dylan the biologist because I wanted to be like more like, hey, I'm Dylan. I'm a person and I'm a biologist. Um, this is who I am. And it was a uh, very, I, I started being on camera a lot more. I started really putting my face out there, which was not my comfort at all. Like I was not at, at first comfortable with that in the slightest, but uh, now I'm, now I, now I love it. I have no issues with it. So the, the rebranding process was uh, doing a very critical look at my accounts and my messaging and what I'm producing. So that was, you know, the name wasn't working. I changed it out. Um, just doing wildlife photography with a caption wasn't really doing it for me. And especially mm -hmm. on the winter time when there was like no more wildlife around, I just yeah. didn't have anything to post. So it just kind of sucked for me. And when I realized people weren't really reading the captions, it was like, meh and you know, I spent like a long time writing each of those captions for them to just, you know, disappear on Instagram after 24 hours. It was mm -hmm. just pointless. So what I did was I focused very much so on, well, if Instagram is my main platform, what works there? What is going on? That's when reels were popping off. Um, I realized carousel posts were really, really beneficial, really helpful because you can convey a lot of information. And I realized it was literally just taking the captions that I was writing and just mm -hmm. making them a carousel instead. And yeah, just kind of allowing myself to fundamentally change absolutely everything. And I tried probably five or six different things before it stuck, uh, different types of content, different things. There's, you know, for every idea that I keep doing, there's at least four or five that I just completely just scrapped. Like I, I tried it for a few months, it didn't work, got rid of it. Um, and now I'm also in like another rebranding phase of uh, the, the trending audio stuff is like fun, but it's not really educational. And that's, you know, I'm like, it works for growth, but education is my biggest thing I want to get with this. So what, what yeah. can I do to make it better? Um, but yeah, I, I think like you should always be rebranding and always be like, is this working? Is it not working? How do I, how do I figure out what's working? How do I figure out what's not working? Uh, just try it out. But uh, the nice thing is I've, the biggest thing uh, that's been helping me out is that I just kind of care less per post. I, I, I post more and I care less per post. And what ends up happening is that, you know, when I was doing like three posts a week and that that was like what I was doing, uh, if one of them bombed, that just sucked. Like yeah. that was, you know, a third of my effort for the week was pointless um, in some capacity. But now that I'm like posting closer to 10 a week because they're all just short things that take maybe 30 seconds to produce and then, mm. you know, an extra minute or two to write up captions and stuff. Um, I don't care if it bombs. Like, I, yeah. I just don't care. And what's happened is my average quality has gone up. Yeah. So it's it's just one of those things of, like, care less, get more out there. Um, and it's it's been very helpful for me. Uh, and, yeah, allows me to actually educate more. So Yeah. Yeah, a lot of great lessons out there for science communicators. Um, and one thing that you said really stuck out to me, and that's that you, you changed it to more humanize yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that I've thought a lot about. People are always more interested in a person than a brand. Mm -hmm. um, it's safer emotionally to hide behind a brand. Um, but yeah, pe people want to see people. That makes yeah. a lot of sense. Right. Yeah, and then I guess there's that, yeah, the double whammy is that you're a person, so... You know, if 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 someone is mad at you, they're not mad at your brand. They're mad at you. Like True. that's the that is the the other angle of it. But uh, not everyone's gonna like you, and that's fine. Uh, yeah. You know, like <laughs> yeah, yeah, very true. Well, what's coming uh, down the pike for the Dylan the biologist brand? Yeah, so I've been doing a lot of uh, over the past few years. I've been working a lot with. Uh, the various companies to like make new types of content. So we'd live streamed some game shows uh, that were all focused on nature, raised money for conservation. 
Um, so those I might still, I'm trying to figure out if I still want to do those in the future. There are a lot of work to put together, um, but I, I really want to do them again, even if they're in like a much lower capacity, because I just think it's such a cool platform and idea. Um, and I'm really working on trying to create resources for incoming biologists mm -hmm. or uh, up and, you know, someone who's maybe in grad school or maybe even undergrad, maybe even in high school. And they know they want to do biology. But they don't have the tools. They don't have the, the specific knowledge to actually, you know, figure it out. So that's where I started making courses. I have a lot of them that are planned, a lot of them that are half made. But I'm also working extremely hard on my website to... Uh, add a whole bunch very cool yeah. very cool um let's see where to take this next well i think what we should do now is give the people what they want mm -hmm. which is frog jokes ah uh so i asked instagram for some questions to ask you and one of the ones that stood out to me was uh, request for your best joke and since you're dealing the biologist I figured it would be best if you had a frog joke so Dylan mm -hmm. I'll tell you mine and then okay you let me know what yours is what is a frog's favorite restaurant what I hop <laughs> Ah, feels like a dad joke. <laughs> All right, Dylan, what do you got? So a frog walks into a bank. Walks up, or I guess hops up to that bank teller and says, hey, I want to take out a loan. Now the bank teller, she doesn't know what the hell's going on. First off, there's a walking, hopping, talking frog. And he wants to take out a loan. Never had anything like this. Don't know if the bank policies actually, you know, allow for interspecies loans. Mm. So she's like, okay, her name's Mrs. Wack. She's like, okay, you want to take out a loan? Frog's like, rip it. Nah, I'm just fucking with you. Yeah, I want to take out a loan. So she's like, okay, well, uh, I'll need to get some information from you. First off, what's your name? He says, Kermit. She's like, no shit. The Kermit the Frog. He's like, yep, no relation though. Just named after that frog. It's like, okay, well, what's your last name? He goes, Jagger. She's like, looking at him, Mrs. Wax, all like, what's going on? She's like, yep, it's true. My full name is Kermit Jagger. My dad is Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. Basically, there was a crazy night on tour. They went to Louisiana. They found a swamp. One thing led to another. Boom, here I am. Kermit Jagger, three to five years old, here to take out a loan. She's like, okay, well, this is weird, but whatever. I've had weirder clients, definitely. She's like, well, I'm going to need some collateral. You don't have any credit history, you know. It's, <laughs> frogs usually don't. So he's like, okay, I got something for you. Reaches into his pocket, because he also has pockets, and pulls out a little bitty little pink elephant. Gives it to her. Lays it right there on the desk. Now, Mrs. Wack, uh, or Patty, she, do, she doesn't know what the hell's going on. Okay, She's like, okay, this is weird. I need to get my manager involved. So she goes to the manager, and Patty explains this whole situation. There's a frog out there. Apparently his dad's a rock star. Gave me this little pink elephant. And the manager just looks at her and just says... This is a knick-knack, Paddywhack. Give the frog a loan. Can't you tell his old man's a rolling stone? <laughs> I was wondering where I was going. <laughs> All right. Well, you won. <laughs> <laughs> you win the frog joke round. All right. So we've got some other questions mm -hmm. uh, from Instagram for you. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Um, at what point did you know... You wanted, well, you didn't say that you necessarily wanted to, but uh, you were leaning towards it. At what point in your grad school experience did you maybe have less interest for going into academia and more interest for doing something else? Uh, when my savings account was completely depleted. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it, it was it was basically a, a realization that 
there was really not that much funds for me, really not much opportunity. It's, it's yeah. one of those where the people there are amazing. I, I do yeah. genuinely appreciate all the people, uh, you know, from all angles. Like my advisor has been awesome. The faculty have been awesome. But it's just the administration uh, just makes it terrible for everyone. Yeah. So uh, I really wanted to change when I realized just how much I was struggling. I, I was I mean, my first year of grad school, I moved to a new city, new state. And I, I couldn't afford a bed for like a year because of yeah. how low it was. And I was like, OK, I'm kind of like I'm like I'm, I'm 24 and I'm sleeping in a sleeping bag just to make it through with like in a house of six other people. Like, what the hell is this? Like, this is yeah. not what I thought grad school is going to look like. And then seeing I have a colleague who's like brilliant and he's sleeping in his car uh, just to make it make ends meet. It's like this is not OK. Um, and it just kept getting worse. It was one of those, you, you know, over time you expect things to get better and it just wasn't mm -hmm. getting better, uh, to the point where I, I quit teaching. I said, I'm not going to do it anymore. I realized it's much easier to make money, uh, elsewhere yep. with my skills. So did that instead. So yeah, that, that was like the big thing. And, and I don't know if I just need like time away from it and then I'm going to want to do something again. But if I do go back into it for any, you know, like getting a PhD or anything like that, I am... Who I am being very picky <laughs> about where I'm going. So, yeah. Yep. Totally get that. Mm -hmm. Let's see what else we got. What would you say is the best part about academia? Ooh, the best part. It, it honestly, it, it is the people. It it mm -hmm. is the people. At the end of the day, um, I've made some just incredible friends. I've, you know, there's there's a few people that I I'm just you're constantly blown away by uh, what they're able to do, what they're able to think and just, just how their mind works. And so just kind of being in that environment for me is really, really nice. But um, I, I think, well, especially with the pandemic where that just wasn't possible um, in, in the same capacity. And I think at, at my specific university right now, we've all just been trying so hard just to get through mm -hmm. every like major bullshit they chuck at us that it's, kind of stopped a whole lot like i'm really not interacting with uh much academics anymore mm. and uh oddly enough my mental health has been better so that's weird uh but <laughs> yeah no it's 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 a uh, de definitely people though definitely people are are you at usc no we're uh so i am at san diego state university okay you're not uh, you're not the school striking right now right no we uh we cannot have a strike uh we Can are I? not a <laughs> yeah we we uh, do not have majority membership in our union, uh, oh. so there's we have no teeth. We really can't do anything. Mm. Um, they they did have a strike over the summer though, uh, well, technically a wildcat strike because they were trying to get rid of our health care. Um, you know, like right after the pandemic, they're like, hey, you don't need health care, but to they're gonna it. but they require us to have health care now. That's a new thing, right. so we can buy their health care. Mm. So I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Academia yeah. does like to eat their young. Yeah. Uh, if, if money were no factor in this, would you rather choose to teach full-time or do research full-time? Ooh, research. Yeah, why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I like teaching, but, it, and, and I will say this is assuming it's teaching in like an academic sense, um, the the culture of teaching is something I'm not as into compared to the teach the culture of research the the culture of research of I can just explore things and build and like uncover like it, it it's something that I just love so 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 much, um, yeah because it's just I don't know there's there's something about there being nothing and no knowledge and no understanding of how a system works and then being the person or the team or whatever to actually figure that out. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's just so cool. It's just so rewarding and so much fun. Um, you know, it, if it was teaching in the sense of there's no grades, if there's no, uh, like just teaching for the benefit of education, just purely the per people there just want to be educated and it's nothing else, then they might actually be a lot closer. Um, but I, I think that we're in a really weird culture shift with teaching right now. And more from the, the student teacher relationship is more transactional, mm. um, than it is, uh, educational. Like it's, yeah. it's the students aren't wanting, you know, and, and not, I'm not trying to like fault students too much. It's like, they're not really wanting to get 
the education. It's they want to get the grade and they want to get the degree. They want to get the accolade. They don't want to get the, the basal like understanding of the system. And that's not necessarily their fault. Like that's the system we're in right now. It's like really, really crappy. Um, right now, I mean, as of, you know, like recording this at the end of December, uh, I, I know many, 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 many educators are getting many, many emails asking for grade bumps, asking yeah. for assignments that are two months old, but they want to redo them. And it's like, it, you know, if I always say if I could actually have 100% control over a course, there would be no uh, grades, no quizzes, uh, only projects, uh, no exams. And yeah, but yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. All right, well, Dylan, the biologist, um, we are nearing the end of our time, and I wanted to still talk about the courses that you have because we didn't yep. get to those. But other than that, was there anything that you wanted to chat about that we didn't already cover? I don't think so. Okay. Then let's jump into it. What what courses do you I, – I know of your R course uh, that you came out recently, but what courses do you have, and when did you start making them? Yeah, so it's it's pretty recent that I started really making them. Uh, I started the R course, which is just Fundamentals of R for Biologists. Um, I started producing it at, I believe, the start of August of this year, and then I finally got it released in September. Um, and then I basically worked another job for two months and uh, <laughs> made money. So, hey. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I wanted to basically build a course. It was like, what was, I wish I had this course when I was learning R. Yeah. That, that's sort of my whole idea with any of the courses is I wish I had this resource whenever I was teaching myself. And I just, I just pared it down. I, I stripped it down a whole bunch because too many tutorials just give you so much information that it's, it's just hard to actually learn from it. Yeah. And I, I realized that if I started with that course, it's actually a really good one to build off of. There's so many different ways that you can utilize R for other courses. Um, like one of the next ones I want to do is spatial data in R. I, I really want to teach how to manipulate spatial data in R. I do all of my spatial analyses, all my GIS work, all of it in R. And I think it's great, but it's, it's hard to say, take this course if you don't even know like what a data frame is in R. Like mm -hmm. It's a little bit more difficult. So realistically, if we're looking at big picture with courses, uh, they're, they're broad in nature for the ones that are being produced. So there's the very technical of like how to code, how to analyze, how to do, how to do this or that. But I also have a few that are hopefully coming out next year uh, that are just focused on like an intro to evolution. Like what is natural selection? Mm -hmm. What is genetic drift? Kind of giving that theory, but making it in a way that is, I, I want it to be a course that is suited for I, I hate saying suited for high schoolers because I, I want it to be understandable to someone with a high school education um, or at least, well, high, U.S. public high school education. So like, a, you know, a fourth grade education. Uh, but then it's like entertaining for everyone. Sure. Uh, just kind of breaking it down. And I'm realizing just how many people don't know anything beyond natural selection and even mm -hmm. then don't have a great working knowledge of how that works. So just kind of building courses on things that I'm fascinated with that I really enjoy and making them. I don't know, entertaining, making them easier to understand and uh, very low stakes. I, I don't want people to be stressed when they're learning, which I think happens so often. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Your your course on R, which I love R, by the way, and that, it's not a language that I'm uh, honestly that familiar with. Um, it was one that I wanted to get into more in grad school, but it wasn't one of the select few that we really had the resources to teach about. Um is your course really just for biologists or is it for kind of anyone who manipulates data that's similar to what you do in biology? Yeah, that's that's actually the top question I have on my frequently asked questions oh, really? for the course because that's I just knew, uh, you know, like, yeah, I, I, you know, talking about niches and like hyper focusing, sure. I, I hyper focused and made it for biologists. And if we even like break it down further, it's for people who are like ecologists, biogeographers, because that's what I made the examples based off of. Okay. However, it's for everyone. It's mm -hmm. it's anyone can learn from it. I, I wanted to use more relatable examples to my field and what we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. So things like uh, like cacti, spine length, or number of tigers in a in a forest or something like that. Um, but I, I, I tried to make it uh, in this very specific focus. It's still very general. Uh, you're still going to learn how to filter a data set. You're still going to learn how to manipulate a data set very, very easily. 
Um, realistically, the only thing that makes it biologist focused is the example data sets that we work with. That, that's mm -hmm. it. All of the actual working R knowledge is for anyone. Very cool. Very cool. And how can people find your course? Yeah, so the quickest way is learnadventurously.com. There's big buttons up at the top that say courses, and you can just get right into it. Very um, cool. That's, yeah, that's the quickest way to access it. And it's it's fifty nine dollars. Is that right? So it normally retails at eighty nine, and okay. then on sale, like I always say, like just just buy sure. it on sale. Like it's yeah. not meant to be bought at full price. If you do, great. But like, hey, uh, wait for it to be on sale. I think with the Black Friday, it ended up being like fifty six dollars. Um, okay. Yeah. So I always say that with that, you're getting realistically about seven weeks of material. Mm -hmm. uh, there's like eighty lessons, a whole bunch. If you're taking that at a university, like a like a full-on four-year state-sponsored university or whatever, uh, that's going to be a $1,500 course. If you're taking it at a community college, that's going to be you know $200 probably. Um, so I try to keep it. I, I've intentionally priced it very low for what it is because I know so many yeah. people need a course for R. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, for not even compared to an in-class course, but to an online course that seems pretty affordable, I took a... Uh, a data analytics course through Coursera to kind of like adjust my researcher analyst skills into more like industry oriented analyst skills. And I think, I mean, it took me a couple months to complete it. And I mean, I probably paid close to 200 right. by the end of it because it was a monthly subscription kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So right, right. I see a lot of courses for to 300 in that range. Yeah, yeah, that that's about what I know. That's what I could sell the course at. But I didn't want to do that because yeah. um, I also just know that a lot of grad students are really needing courses like this. Like very few universities sure. really offer our courses. And if they do, they're not honestly that great. Um, yep. So, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my kind of model is sell that one course so that you can buy other courses down the road. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. And we didn't offer we didn't have our offered. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, I think a lot of people are in that boat. Well, mm. Dylan. We covered a lot today. Mm -hmm. Any parting thoughts for all the grad students listening? Um, know your worth and also capitalize on your worth. Um, yeah. if, if you're a great at data analysis, I can guarantee you, you can find a remote job doing data analysis for anywhere that will probably pay you double to triple what you're being paid as a TA. Yeah. Um, I'm a, you know, if you're in the biology, if you're in a big city, uh, I can guarantee you there are consulting firms that are hiring and are looking for people right now that will pay you way more than you are for TAing. Um, I, I, I know that a lot of people get stuck in TAing, and if you're international student, especially, you're unfortunately really stuck. Mm -hmm. But um, if if you have the ability to not TA uh, at a really low starvation wage, do it. Um, it, it will make your research better. It'll make your time in academia way better and your mental health will be way, 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 way better. Yeah. Wise words. All right. Dylan, the biologist, you can find him on Instagram at Dylan, the biologist. You've got your website, which is learn adventurously.com. Yes. And was there anything else? You have a YouTube channel. We didn't even mention that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I don't know what I'm doing with YouTube. At the oh, moment. sure. Yeah. <laughs> it's the yeah. same thing, though, Dylan the Biologist. Right now, I just live stream my research on there. So, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. All right, Dylan. Well, this was an awesome conversation. Thank you for coming on the show. And uh, I look forward to staying in contact with you. Yeah, for sure. This was fun. All right. I'll see you next time. Yeah, yeah. Folks, thank you for tuning in to the Grad School Sucks podcast. I hope you got a lot out of my interview with Dylan today. It was awesome to hear about his growth as a science communicator and find out how current grad students can start their own platform in science communication. Be sure to check out the description of today's episode for links to Dylan's Instagram and website. If you did end up enjoying today's episode, please consider leaving a rating or review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. It really does mean a lot to me as a content creator when folks leave ratings and written reviews for the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Matt Carlson, and I look forward to bringing you another great episode next week. As promised, hear Dylan's responses to the bonus questions. See you all next time. So Dylan, the first question, and I feel like I know the answer to this, but what is your spirit animal? Oh, 
it's a frog. Yeah. Yeah, it's a frog. The what exact frog? frog is a little amorphous. Like, I don't know which species exactly. Oh, okay. Because they all have their own special traits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What what specifically about a frog? <sighs> you see, it's it's funny because I I actually kind of go back and forth between frog and salamander. Okay. If I'm really thinking about it. Because at the end of the day, they're just cool. Mm-hmm. Like, that's it. Like, to me, they are the guy in the blue jeans and the white shirt working on their muscle car down the road. You don't know their name, but you're kind of scared of him. He might bully you. That's what frogs are to me. Yeah. And so if I wanted to say what one trait, if I had to say one trait, what made it my spirit animal? I don't know why, but I'm thinking about the toe pads. I don't know what that is. They have these, so they have like distally expanded toe pads, like a lot of them anyway, at least the the tree frogs do to climb up. And there's something about that. Wait, can I say fuck? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. I fuck with that. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I was really into uh, frogs and lizards as a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, And I remember specifically uh, my dad's side of the family has like some cabins on this tiny lake in the middle of nowhere in Minnesota. And we would go there in the summers. And I remember, I don't remember how old I was, maybe like seven or eight. I remember seeing a big frog because there were frogs everywhere that year. I saw a big frog eating a little frog. And I was like, holy shit. And it was <laughs> it was almost like a coming of age moment of like, <laughs> life is brutal out there eating oh, through yeah. frogs. But Oh, gosh, yeah. That, that's just what's cool about them. They do so many like unexpected things, which is yeah. like the more I look into them, I'm like, why is there still so many just exceptions to the rule with them? It's yeah. kind of nuts. Yeah. All right. Question number two, Dylan. Mm-hmm. What is your real life superpower? So not like a made up thing, but like literally Dylan's real superpower. Ooh. Ooh, that's a good one. So I often mm, there's like there's like a stereotypical one I say where I'm just like my anxiety because it, you know, makes me do right. things. It makes yeah. me want to just keep working all the time. But then I'm also I'm also like hypermobile, um, like crazy hypermobile. Uh, always been able to like put my leg behind my head and like uh, dislocate things like crazy. Um, you know, like with any superpower, there's downsides to For it. sure. Um, but it's, it's, it's honestly been just a little bit helpful in everyday situations. Like yeah. if I have to reach around like someone to grab something, I could just like pop my elbow back and grab it. So it's a little bit easier, you know, mm. it's just like little things like that. Or like, I have a lot of flexibility in my toes, which is, I could just pick up things really huh. easily with my toes and I fan them out. So it's just like a little bit weird, Yeah, but it's super kind of frog like. It is in kind some of ways. like, yeah, it is. I'm definitely the opposite and I need to get back into yoga now that I think about it. Um, number question number three is if you could have one place in the world where you could teleport to anytime you want and then teleport back whenever you wanted, what would that place be? There's a really good swamp that I know. Okay. <laughs> I just, it's just my favorite place. I would go there so often and I haven't yeah. been in years. Um, but it's just it's just isolated. There's always something going on there. I uh, mm-hmm. always find really cool critters. And it was just always kind of like my happy place. So I, I wish I could just go there anytime. Yeah, that's awesome. Definitely the first time somebody has said a swamp. Um, <laughs> but that makes sense. 